Okay, hello and welcome to another edition of Ask a Gemologist. I am GIA gemologist and jewelry designer of the Moon Tree Boutique, Claire Tannhauser. And today we are going to be discussing a little bit of the science, the history, and the folklore of the gemstone peridot. So um, let's start with the super duper basics and that is pronunciation. The T is silent. It is not pronounced peridot, it is pronounced peridot. So that is the industry standard and I just thought I would clear that up before we jump into the more complicated stuff because I know that is a frequently asked question. Um, so let's start with the science because you guys know me, I just am a total science nerd. So how does peridot form? What is it? So scientifically speaking, peridot is the gem quality of the mineral olivine. So olivine is a heavy, opaque, common rock prevalent all over the world. But sometimes there's very specific and unique conditions that create peridot crystals, which is the gem version of the mineral olivine. So how does that happen? Well, there are two ways primarily that it happens and they both involve enormous amounts of heat and pressure inside the earth. So the first way is something called orogeny, which plainly put is mountain building. And that is when you have two tectonic plates on the surface of the earth that are pushing against each other or sliding under each other and creating these really unique conditions of insane heat and pressure that can what is called metamorphose the olivine into peridot. The other way that this metamorphosis happens is through volcanism. So you can also get that level of enormous heat and pressure through volcanic events, which are also facilitated frequently by tectonic movement. So um, both, of, both of those processes take this reasonably common prevalent mineral, which is opaque and dense and not particularly attractive, and squeeze it into this beautiful jewel, this grassy green translucent peridot crystal that's highly refractive. And when it's cut and polished, when the light hits it, it breaks the white light into a spectrum of colors and it is so flashy and beautiful. And that is why it is used frequently in the gemstone jewelry of today, but also in ancient times. So we'll get to that um, as well. So the word peridot comes from the Arabic ferida, which means simply gem. Hitting, hinting at its ancient history in the cradle of civilization. Heck, peridot is even mentioned in the Old Testament, in the Bible, on the breastplate of Aaron, um, the high priest of the temple, and it is encrusted with these jewels, and one of them is peridot. So it really is a gemstone that has an enormous amount of history to it. Um, Let's talk about the ancient Egyptians. They also used peridot quite a bit in their jewelry and adornment. Uh, we see it represented in headdresses and in art set into headdresses. And then we also see it in grave goods as jewelry, beads, and most importantly, these seals that are carved, big pieces of peridot that have been carved with a seal that can be impressed in um, wax or clay and leave a distinct impression that is like a verified authentic identity for the person who made that mark. So early s document security uh, pertaining to peridot. And where did the Egyptians get this peridot? So they would go all the way out in the Red Sea to this one tiny little volcanic island, like we spoke about earlier, how volcanism turns um, olivine into peridot. 
and they would collect it at great peril and bring it back to the mainland and do different wonderful things with it. And we've found examples um, in grave goods and they're represented in different museums around the world now. Um, what the ancient Egyptians did with Peridot, they really valued it, which is quite wonderful. Um, let's talk a little bit about the European Middle Ages because many kings, uh, including the Holy Roman Emperor, Otto I, uh, really put a lot of peridot in their crowns and regalia to connote the wealth and power that they were able to get this rare and highly desirable gemstone. Um, but in Europe, these folks often, instead of using the, the term peridot, used the term chrysolite, um, as well, which is a Greek term that actually means golden stone and was used frequently for peridot, although sometimes also for topaz because they didn't have scientific tests back then. They were identifying things just kind of based on look. And um, peridot does really have golden yellow undertones to the green color, unlike the other alternative green gem available to them in the European Middle Ages, which was emerald which is a real blue based green color, a very, very different tone. So they called it golden stone. And I think that is quite interesting. Um, the gemstone is uh, mentioned several times in Shakespeare's Othello. So it is really prevalent in, in the Middle East, in Europe. Uh, really all throughout history we see this gem being mentioned in various interesting ways. So now let's talk a little bit about the esoteric history of the metaphysical properties of peridot. That is to say the long tradition of notions regarding the innate qualities of this gemstone beyond those measurable by science. So to wit, the Christian bishop and 10th century poet Marbodius of Reims wrote extensively like volumes and volumes about peridot and its ability to ward off evil spirits so even in that liturgical tradition this was still really valued as something that would be beneficial to the wearer and not only was it used as an amulet and um, worn around the neck it was also ground into a powder and consumed, ingested into the body for a variety of ailments, um, particularly the records indicate ailments pertaining to the eyes. So um, I think there might have been some idea of sympathetic magic because people have perhaps green eye color. I'm not really sure. I couldn't find any evidence or any information about why it was thought to be good specifically for the eyes, but that did come up a number of times in the ancient um, texts. So another um, fun shout out about Peridot was the German occult writer Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, one of my favorites in the early 1500s. And he spoke about how peridot could be used when you hold it to up to the sun and it casts a yellowish green shadow. If you align that shadow up with your chest, that it is good for respiratory ailments. So there really is a, a long um, tradition of appreciating this stone for its visual and physical attributes, as well as these other... Um, ethereal attributes that um, have been remarked on throughout time. So there you have it, some different um, stories from the long history of Peridot from the Old Testament to Shakespeare to Agrippa in no particular order. So now let's get back to the science because you know I'm me and I just love that stuff. So Volcanic activity, as I mentioned, is frequently associated with peridot, which is often found crystallized inside lava. <laughs> so cool. Um, fine grains of peridot can be found all over the volcanic beaches of Hawaii and is known by the indigenous inhabitants as the Tears of Pele. Again, an association um, perhaps with eyes. 
So Pele was the volcanic goddess of creation and destruction. So she's again associated with Pirido, a volcanic stone. Um, and aside from diamonds, which also are brought up as gemstone crystalline entities through the asthenosphere to the surface by molten rock, uh, that is also how Peridot makes it to the surface. So the magma, the volcanic melted rock will carry it up to the Earth's surface. And that is not how most gemstones form. So it's super, super cool. And in addition to being created deep in the mantle of the Earth, Peridot crystals have occasionally been found inside four billion year old meteorites from outer space, um, which we can trace back to the birth of our solar system. So if you thought the ancient Egyptian history was old, that ain't nothing. We are talking about literally the birth of our universe, which is just astonishing, astonishing stuff. Um, it's even hypothesized that there's peridot crystals on Mars because there were similar conditions of extreme heat and pressure that, um, if the correct mineral ingredients are present, can, we know, crystallize to form peridot. But let's leave space and go back to Earth for a second. Um, what do you need to know when you're buying peridot and looking at peridot? So let's get a little practical here for a second. Um... And I know people often are confused by these big gemological revelations that I talk about, like, you know, for instance, garnet doesn't have to be red or sapphire comes in lots of different colors. And I really blindsided people with all this confusing new information. But um, fortunately, peridot is one of the few gemstones that only occurs in one color. So you don't have to worry about learning about a whole spectrum of different types of peridot. There's just the the peridot and it's all in this range of the yellowy green hue. The saturation and clarity can be somewhat variable depending on the location and the particular piece. But um, all in all, it's a great stone for beginners because it, it just comes in one color and it's really not a gemstone that's commercially treated. So you're not going to find dyed or irradiated peridot out there. It's just not a commonly treated stone. So it's a great stone for people who don't necessarily know every in and out of the different gemstone and treatment and variations, etc. So, so my tips for buying peridot... Um, would be if you're looking at pieces of jewelry, I would really think about what you like, what speaks to you. Um, obviously, the larger the stone, likely the more costly it will be. Um, but it's important that it's just it's something you connect with and that you find beautiful and are excited to wear. Um, if you're looking to buy a mineral specimen, in addition to the size, the clarity, and the color, another factor in ascertaining value is how intact the crystal is. So if it still has a lot of its natural faces, meaning um, when it formed in a particular shape with a pointed top, which is called the termination of the crystal, those are the most sought after uh, mineral specimens when the crystal is complete and intact. A broken piece, sort of a chip off of a larger crystal, is going to be considered less desirable as a mineral specimen. If you're interested in having peridot on your person for metaphysical reasons, a tumbled stone might be a great um, choice where it's been tumble polished so it's nice and smooth to keep in your pocket or in your medicine bag or whatever you wish to do with it. Um, I'm gonna take this opportunity to show a couple pieces that I have in inventory that are a lot of fun. I have a habit of taking whole natural terminated crystals and setting them um, into finished jewelry as though they were cabochons, which are the polished stones typically used in jewelry. So these are natural peridot crystals from Afghanistan, which I have set the whole crystals um, in rings as stones. And a number of these type of rings are also on my webpage, moontreeboutique.etsy.com. 
and I have some beautiful faceted peridot beads with different pendants. This one has an Ethiopian opal pendant. This one, which I love the juxtaposition of the green and the purple, has a charoite pendant from Russia. Um, you can see the little faceted peridot beads. These are chip peridot beads, meaning they are not faceted. They're just tumble polished. And this particular piece also has some um, purpurite, which is a natural mineral, um, accenting the green. I guess I like green and purple together because I seem to have repeated that color combo quite a bit. You can see more of my natural gemstone jewelry um, at my Etsy shop or on my Instagram, Moon Tree Boutique. And I so appreciate you participating and watching this video. Please leave your um, questions in the comment section below. And I'd love to answer and cover any areas that I forgot or didn't touch upon. Um, also, let me know what you're interested in seeing for the next Ask a Gemologist video. And um, I will also leave in the description of this video below the different books I used for the research of this video. I have a great um, library, reference library of gemological books, and I will include those as well in my citations. And really just thank you so much for watching. If you want to help spread the word, please comment or like or subscribe or share or any of those things to help me um, grow my little following. And I, I hope you enjoyed this Ask a Gemologist. Thank you so much. Have a terrific day. Bye.